Welcome to our first webinar of 2022 at Justice and Care. Um, for those that don't know, my name is Jamie Fileman. I'm one of the directors of Justice and Care with responsibility, and particularly for fundraising and communications. It's, it's great to see so many um, on this evening's call from such a variety of backgrounds to some of our incredibly generous donors, supporters, uh, but also people involved in, in government, other charities and um, the police, other frontline workers. So thank you so much um, for taking the time to join us, taking three quarters of an hour out of your precious um, evening. I'm gonna give it a, a few moments for other people to join the call and I'll then introduce um, our panel this evening. We've got a cracking um, group of people to share some of their experience. But before I do, um, just a bit of housekeeping, so to speak. We want you to post um, questions um, for some of the panellists to answer, which we'll do um, or to aim to do it towards the end um, of the session. Um, and you can post those um, through the question box and I'll keep an eye on them. And as I said, I'm trying to get them answered um, towards the end. But please don't wait until the very end to post questions. We generally find that there are more questions than we can answer. And so if they come in early and we get to go through um, more. We will be aiming to finish. I'll do everything that I possibly can to get us finishing on time um, at 6 um, 45 p.m. So let's give a bit of context and, and some of you or most of you will probably know this anyway, but some of the context for the webinar. Slavery as we all know, is everywhere. And there are more than 100,000 victims in the UK alone, more than 40 million globally. Um, it's a much bigger problem than any single organisation or indeed any sector can possibly hope to tackle. And it's why Justice and Care, for Justice and Care, our passion so much is about how do you spark, how do you create systemic change? How do you work with, with governments and, and other stakeholders to affect change at scale? And how do we actually successfully do that? And particularly, how do we do it in the midst and hopefully the soon, the aftermath of a pandemic? Well, to help us try and think through this topic, I'm delighted to welcome the three panelists, amazing people. Um, Helen Taylor is the Director of Grant Programmes at the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery, where she coordinates um, programme design and oversees implementation of just like transformative projects um, around the world, including our own work in, in Bangladesh that the Global Fund very kindly um, support. Helen previously conducted human rights policy advocacy at Physicians for Human Rights and the US State Department. And Caroline Howey, QC, OBE. Caroline is a criminal barrister specialising in prosecuting modern slavery and human trafficking cases. And she prosecuted, I think, the first modern slavery case in the UK and has been involved in, in many of the most significant prosecutions since, um, including actually the largest ever labour trafficking and exploitation case um, in Europe called Operation for Caroline helped draft the Modern Slavery Act in 2015 and advises other countries on legislation and, and effective prosecutions against human trafficking and exploitation, which she'll talk about a little bit, I'm sure, later. And finally, Nicole Munns. Nicole um, works at Justice and Care, one of the directors, and um, she leads our International Systemic Change Unit, which is really focused um, on the development um, of research and evidence-based practice in combating modern slavery. She um, collaborates with, with leading experts, policymakers, practitioners from around the world um, to promote learning from the front line um, and evidence-based decision-making for, for politicians and others. Thank you all so much for joining me. Helen, um, I just want to get you to introduce, because I think GFEMS, will, people will possibly know less of that. Um, can you just explain a little bit of, of what GFEMS is, what, what the Global Fund you do? Certainly. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction and for the opportunity to speak today about something that's very near and dear to our hearts at GFEMS, which is how do we actually collaborate for change? And that's precisely what GFEMS was stood up to, to address. There are broadly three things that the Global Fund aims to do. The first is to mobilize resources. The second is to collaborate with partners. And the third is to invest in solutions. 
So in terms of mobilized resources, we know that we don't have the resources commensurate to meet the challenge of modern slavery. Just for a little bit of background, our best estimates on um, government investment in modern slavery is about 400 to 600 million dollars a year, which is a lot of money, don't get me wrong, um, but that's looking at around 25, estimated 25 million to 40 million people in modern slavery, depending on how you count people in modern slavery. In comparison, um, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, which is about you know, 26 million refugees in the world, similar in size, their annual budget is about $9 billion. And for those of you who aren't as good at math, I've done it for you. It's about 20 times greater. And I'm not at all suggesting that UNHCR should have less funding, but rather pointing to a disparity in the level of resources that we are investing globally in these, these similar populations in terms of livelihoods upturned, often away from home, um, the level of trauma. Um, accorded. So it's just a disparity to point out, um, not to say that, you know, one is more important than the other, but that each should be given um, resources to fully address them. The second is we really want to collaborate with partners to advance strategic break breakthroughs in the field. So that means, you know, collaborating with partners like Justice and Karen Bangladesh, who um, really understand the local context. And that also means working with partners like private sector companies. Um, both of those entities are trying to figure out how to end exploitation in their spheres of influence, and we want to help with that. The third is to invest in solutions to understand what really works. Um, GFEMS pilots, replicates, and scales successful models, and we invest in effective research practices to really share an understanding of what could be most helpful in different places. Um, so before we stood up the organization, we were seeing great work happening around the world, but those organizations were often siloed. So something that we try to do is really make sure that anyone understands justice and care's great work and where their successes are. And um, you know, justice and care can also learn from our other partners in the portfolio. So I'll just pause there for now, but um, yeah, those three things, mobilize resources, collaborate with partners and invest in solutions. And, and Helen, as you, as you take, it's a, such a great introduction, but as you take like a global view, as you see organizations like Justice and Care working around the world, what do you see as the, as the critical global issues that need to be addressed in terms of modern slavery and human trafficking? Yeah, I think that a lot of them stem from under-resourcing. Um, so the UN, of course, set a very ambitious goal, a sustainable development goal to not have any modern slavery by 2030. And we are really, really far off the mark. Um, and I think part of that is because we haven't identified you know, what is most effective in all of these different situations. And I used to say you know, a little bit cheaply, if you ask 10 people working in anti-modern slavery what modern slavery is, you'll get 10 different definitions. And that's because it's in every sector with different groups of people. It is really, really hard to pin down and say, this is the one thing that will work every time. We don't live in that world. Um, and so that is one of the challenges. But I think by 2030, we can identify breakthroughs. So we can start to coalesce as a field around things that we know are consistent and work. And that might be in you know, trauma-informed practices, that may be in reintegration communities and livelihood, that may be in reducing vulnerability. For example, we know that taking um, really predatory loans happens among almost every single population that we are working with. So I think it is possible to start identifying those breakthrough pieces and then spreading the word about what has been successful in addressing them. Do you have a, a view as to why, I guess, the, the sector is behind the curve compared to other areas of work, why it's failed to attract so much funding and, and clear answers to some problems? Yeah, I think that where we've seen the most success in um, some of these different development fields, we look at, you know, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. Public health is, of course, very different. Um, but one thing we really see is uh, investment in the resources, you know, in this case, billions of dollars, 
that people are then able to use to deliver life-saving vaccines and medications. Um, and the other thing that public health has in their favor is you know, something like a vaccine, a silver bullet that they can be fairly sure will work with the majority of the population regardless of context. So then it just becomes more of a challenge of if we're in a different country, what are their practices that will help them pick up, you know, taking this, these certain medications or using mosquito nets to prevent malaria, whatever the practice may be. And we still really have that challenge in the anti-slavery field. You know, when we, even when we talk about um, sex trafficking, people feel that's something different from forced labor. And when we talk about forced labor, we say, well, is that in construction or is that in apparel or is that in domestic work? The answer is it's in, in everything, you know, mining, agriculture. And so can't really say this worked really well in apparel factories. Let's try it in cocoa fields. Um, they're completely different. So that is part of the challenge in the sectors and the, the issue that we've chosen to tackle. So it's no silver bullet, but there, there is, you, you know, you, you identify this, this lack of funding and, and the clear need for, for governments to step up and invest funds in, mm -hmm. in this. And yet in, 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 the, in the back of a, a pandemic of, of a few brutal years where economies are being recovered, governments are just trying to work out what, what's on their, their immediate agenda. Do you think there's real hope of, of getting this lifted up individual governments and indeed you know, in the UN and other agencies like getting it lifted up on the agenda in reality? I believe it's an imperative and I say that because when we saw the beginning of the pandemic we were able to measure an instant increase in vulnerability in the groups we were working with around the world consistently and what I mean by that is over 90 percent of the groups we were working with um, talked about needing to take out loans, often predatory loans, just to survive. Um, and these are people who work day to day. If they don't work, then they don't have money to feed their family or pay for medicine or pay their rent. And so, you know, being in a lockdown situation, um, they were immediately without jobs and without income. And even in seeing, um, you know, these communities be marginalized, in their daily life, that's often why they end up being trafficked or in forced labor. Um, it was really interesting to see the marginalization even in emergency care or emergency aid. So particularly near the beginning of the pandemic, there were massive government programs trying to help people and there was a lot of aid going into different countries. And I'll just take Bangladesh as an example. Um, in the groups we were working with, less than 3% of people had received any sort of aid. And there are barriers to that, you know, maybe they didn't have the right identification documents or they couldn't actually get to the office where that aid was being distributed. Um, but it's important to remember that the same factors that make people very vulnerable outside of a pandemic exacerbate um, those situations. So we can't really say we're addressing the pandemic if we're not addressing the situations of people most vulnerable to modern slavery. And so useful. Caroline, I want to bring you into the, the discussion. What role can a change of, of law play in creating systemic change in terms of the issue of slavery? Well, um, the optimistic side of me, thank you, Jamie, is that uh, by changing the law, you can create a solution. But actually, what you do is you create a path to the solution. All of the things that Helen said are absolutely reflected in what I see day to day in my role um, prosecuting in this field. Um, so it, it's identification. When we drafted the Modern Slavery Act, one of the things we were curtailed by is the definitions that we have to use are the ones that come from the uh, UN Directive, Palermo Protocol on trafficking. But that's the point. It's the Palermo Protocol on trafficking. It doesn't actually deal with the definitions of what modern slavery are. Modern slavery is subsequently identified in this jurisdiction by European Court of Human Rights definition uh, in a case called Slidia. And it defines a, a, a triangle, if you like. So you've got slavery, chattel-like ownership, then running underneath that, the two bottom ends of it, and I don't say that pejoratively, I just mean that's how it is visually. Um, you would have forced and compulsory labor 
or you would have domestic servitude. But how do you define something that is exploitation? It's, it's not a dead body where you've got murder. It's not theft where someone's taken something from someone else. It's not a sexual assault where someone has not consented to an act taking place on them. Dare I say it, it can be all of those things rolled into one. The thing that I would always say is, when does poor employment become criminal employment? When is the fact that someone is working in pretty pants conditions with not great money, when does that actually traverse right into criminal exploitation? And there is no black and white definition. And that's what makes it really challenging because unlike any other criminal offense, it's binary. Someone either did or didn't take the money. Someone either did or didn't hit you. Someone either did or didn't rape or sexually assault you. Someone either did or didn't kidnap you. And it's normally the identification of that. That is the tragedy of the law in this. So although it is not a cure-all, what it does define is a pathway how to get there. And it makes it more effective for people in my role to prosecute. It um, makes a mark. So this is why it is important to have the legislation. It says we as a jurisdiction don't tolerate this. So I'm doing some work in the Middle East at the moment for a Gulf state. And the view that I've been asked is, can I rewrite their legislation? Which yes. Two, how does the legislation that I'm crafting impact another legislation? So they're not looking just at their modern slavery legislation. They're actually looking at their labor laws, their employment laws. What is the definition of a domestic worker versus a um, migrant worker? And all of those kind of factors affect what we do, affect and affect how we craft law and how we implement law and how we apply law. Again, you're, you're painting just the complexity of the of the issue makes this actually very, very difficult to deal with. Look, um, whenever I speak to police officers, many who've never had any experience of investigating these cases, once you turn over the stone, you're in it for life. You get sucked in. But it's not binary when you're dealing with slavery and exploitation. It just isn't and trafficking. It's in all the cases that I've prosecuted. I have never had it where it's just been singular exploitation offending on the criminality that we're dealing with. You might have identity theft include, you may have sexual assaults, physical assaults, threats, kidnapping, false imprisonment, fraud being conducted after the ID theft, money laundering being done through um, accounts. You will have subsidiary offending of forced and compulsory marriages or just forced marriages or false immigration applications or any number of other things happening through that. And most, and this isn't a criticism, police officers, when they're investigating a case, they have a start point and an end point. It goes back to what I said just a minute ago. Who stole the money? Who assaulted who? Who's the dead body? Who created the dead body? One slavery and exploitation isn't like that. And consequentially, society struggles to understand that A, it happens, and as Helen said, that it happens in every single sector. And no sector is clear of this. And one of the things that uh, I've noticed, and in fact, which Nicole and I work closely on, is trying to work out what is the best way forward. So in fact, it's bringing in something Helen said, what works in agriculture might not work in fishing, might not work in, um, I don't know, might not work in the bricklaying industry, okay? So, or in construction. So what we've done through the McCain Institute is we've created um, a prosecutor's consortium because it's lonely, okay? There aren't many of us doing this and finding other people who are in a like position to share their experiences and not just the how to, but the how not to's is vitally important. And that network and the reach of that has been phenomenal. So we've got, uh, Nicole, I'm gonna defer to you, about 15 of us who meet online, but from random places, including in the back of a taxi in Uganda, uh, me from outside Court 14 in the Old Bailey, um, someone uh, behind a warehouse when they're about to do a site visit in Bangladesh. I mean, it's been an eclectic gathering of us. But what we've done is we've been sharing our, what works. What can we learn from each other? What have we found out that's going on between Nigeria and Italy? 
And how can we use a special procedure that they've used? Can we adapt that in the UK between us and the Romanians? And my opposite number in Romania and I are working on that as a sideline. Um, we've had one of our Irish counterparts raise a query in a case, and we all had different perspectives on it. So they're now going off and taking that. Shared experience, shared knowledge is absolutely vital because nobody has the cure-all answer. Education and consistent understanding. And as you start to build that consistency of understanding, as you start to build those those networks, what is the hope of, of changing laws, you know, both within certain jurisdictions, but also globally? How can we start to get the framework work that is needed to get some of the progress that, that Helen was, was talking about earlier? For me, education first and foremost, education at a government level so that they understand that this happens. I won't name a jurisdiction, but a jurisdiction that I advised on crafting legislation um, genuinely said to me that lawyers in their jurisdiction, well, we don't have any of these cases. Well, of course you don't have any of these cases because you don't have the law under which you can prosecute them. So, you know, that's a really obtuse approach. So education at a government level to understand that this offending happens in every jurisdiction. You have both victims and perpetrators. No jurisdiction, first, second or third world is clear of this. That's the first point. Secondly, effective drafting and implementation, and the two are hand in hand. You may have the legislation on the books, but if it's not effectively deployed, what's the point? With that, implementation requires education from the implementers, be that judges, lawyers uh, or prosecutors, um, and police officers and investigators, so that they are all on the same path. There is all a consistent level and approach. And trafficking, by its very nature is moving. We can't, we can't keep it confined jurisdictionally. We have to be open-minded and open-bordered about this. So we have to work and collaborate with each jurisdiction and sharing knowledge, information and experience with each other. We're doing it informally with prosecutors. Why? Why has it taken the McCain Institute and Justice and Care and me, the least important person in all of this, to get us together to talk. Surely we should all be doing this if we want to achieve these changes by 2030. And the final thing I'd say is just drawing this attention to the public. If the public see it, the public will call it out. It'll stop it at the beginning, it'll stop it happening, and it'll ensure that we get the right verdicts when it's happening under our very noses and we get to prosecute it. Well, that's so helpful. Nicole, I think you know, the scale of the project, the problem can just be overwhelming. And, and the natural, I think, is to look to, to governments to act. What do you see as, as the role that charities like Justice and Care can, can play? Thanks, Jamie. Yes, um, look, I think charities bring really important additional resources and expertise to a really complex space um, as both my um, other panelists have, have, have shared um, there are such complexities um, in, in this area of crime to do with the fact that it's a hidden crime uh, that th that it is non-binary as Caroline described um, and and no one um, party, even the government, does ha has has full visibility into that. So um, it does very much require a, a, a collaborative um, a approach. Charities um, can also, um, through their operational work, uh, scale and bring scale and and understanding that can help drive uh, better policies, better laws and allocation of resources. Uh, we're doing that in a number of areas. Um, we are doing that through our Victim Navigator Program. We're doing that uh, as Ca um, Caroline shared in, in terms of uh, this consortium, uh, bring, providing a platform to share and we're sharing the lessons that we're seeing in our own frontline work, um, uh, bringing together other prosecutors um, that are um, in different jurisdictions, but that are bringing important pieces to the puzzle so that we can be then taking, extracting lessons and using them for, for change at scale. And it sounds as if like collaboration is, is essential, but also has been 
largely missing in in the fight if we if we start to read between some of the lines that have been said this evening that's right um look i'm encouraged jamie to see that i think there's a growing appetite for it because i think it is a really obvious um and under under emphasized piece uh, to the puzzle um, there are, as i say there are opportunities to address the complexities um, uh, that that just wouldn't otherwise be available uh, there are opportunities to 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 also collaborate not just operationally and not just um, uh, in terms of best practice but to do research together and um, to actually also we talked about uh, the fact that uh, we can't necessarily just extract lessons in one place and apply them in another. So we really need to think long and hard about what works where and why before we try to, 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 to apply that in other settings. And I think it requires a really considered approach. And I'm so excited to start to see um, uh, both researchers, but also those that are very evidence-based to, to be coming together to share their learnings so that we, we can't possibly even fill those knowledge gaps um, ourselves, but we need to, to, to actually almost map what we understand and apply those, those lessons uh, more broadly. And Helen's called earlier for that, that real need for evidence. What works, what works, what works is, is I guess, music to, to your ears, because that, that's so much about what, what you're, you're doing in the, in the International Systemic Change Unit. That's right. We are, look, we, we are actually, we've had some wonderful conversations along the way uh, with the Global Fund um, and with other actors, and we're excited to be actually uh, both sharing what we're learning, but learning from from their great work and um, and the research and and uh, fostering that that sort of learning and um, environment that enables us to to have as much impact as possible, and particularly at scale. I think I think for me, at scale, it's even more important to 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 be well informed, uh, because obviously we're looking at um, a much greater reach and much greater impact. Potential. Right, and, and I'm interested, Helen, maybe you could answer this. If, if you've got questions, please put them in the chat. We'll come to them in a second. But I, I'd like to, to come into the, like, the reality, if you like, of that, you know, Helen, you talked about the difficulty. Nicole said the same about different environments. The answers might be different in different places because of different cultures. But you're seeing and you're, you're bringing together organizations in lots of ways on a global level. Is there more to be learned from one another? Are you finding that actually there is more in common or more different from location to location? I find that there are a number of factors in common. So I mentioned one earlier, the debt bondage is very consistent throughout. Um, and also the, the approaches that we try to employ to support people, um, particularly the trauma-informed approaches in rehabilitation. So there are always going to be commonalities and the level of support we provide for each of those really differ. Um, but one thing, for example, that we really loved about Justice and Cares program in Bangladesh is that they're working with survivor champions and now trained you know, a cadre of survivor champions, the small group to actually be um, some of the first people that recently rescued survivors are able to talk to. So um, it builds a lot of confidence because those people who understandably have a lot of trauma and a lot of trust issues are able to speak to someone who has literally gone through something similar. And there are so much that they just don't have to un explain, right? And um, that's really what we see as the best practice. And so that's an example of something that we've shared with others. And they have said, oh, you know, how can we, how can we cultivate or start something like this in our own program? And then there are other places where, um, you know, across almost all of our projects, when we get a concept note and we review it, we, we often go back to the applicant and say, do you have um, a study showing the effectiveness of this? It sounds really good and we like it on paper. And they said, you know, a lot of them say, no, no donor has ever been willing to pay to understand how effective this is. Um, and that's something where we really want to step in and say, well, we're going to pay for that. Because what we feel is that even though that is um, money, you know, sometimes people say, oh, there's money on research and it's not helping, you know, survivors directly, but we would rather spend the money on understanding what is effective so that we don't keep throwing 
you know, money after a bad practice. We don't want to keep on paying for activities that actually may be harmful, which unfortunately we've seen done um, a little bit in the field. So, you know, it's, it's absolutely essential to keep on learning from each other. Um, and I think something else that <laughs> we take for granted is that people have time to get together and to talk for three or four days about these pressing issues. People really don't. And, um, you know, unless you have staff specifically paid to do that, it's really, really difficult to do. Um, I have, I'll admit that I've also been a participant in conferences where you go for a day and you all talk about you know, the biggest challenges, and then you go home and nothing happens with it because you don't have time and energy and you're working by yourself, as Caroline mentioned. Um, so really creating those community of practices around different topics has been um, critical for us, but it's still a big challenge. And Caroline, I'd love to, like, yeah, I, I, was, I was struck earlier where you just talked about how lonely it is. Um, yeah. Part of the lawyers fighting protein slavery and, and the impact that this bringing together people from across the world, have you again found that because it, it must be each each country has its different laws, etc. Have mm. you found huge commonality again that, that has been really useful for you? Oh yeah. I mean, well, Nicole has sat in on all of our meetings, and it's fair to say putting a bunch of lawyers in a room is never going to be a quiet event. Um, and you can imagine what it's like when there's 15 of us on Zoom with um obviously different translation happening, although we're blessed that the vast majority um, are excellent English speakers. But it is fascinating. And actually, can I be honest, it's really uplifting to know that we're not alone. And one of the things that's been really interesting is talking about um, how do we keep victims engaged? Because in our criminal justice system, I've got a case that I'm advising on at the moment, where the criminality was taking place in 2017, and we're not even at charge. Okay. Operation Fort, the case that you referred to earlier, the criminality was 2014 through to 2019. I got an email today. I'm still waiting for the main defendant to come back to, from Poland, and I will not be prosecuting him till next year. So that's seven years after my victims have been exploited. And there's no dispute that they have been exploited. But having people who are sharing experiences with each other and knowing that you're not fighting this alone. Uh, it's my favorite quote ever. It's by Robert F. Kennedy and it talks about the ripples of change. And he gave it when he was talking about apartheid in South Africa. Each person can be a ripple and together those ripples together can become a tsunami of change. Um, actually, all of us in our own little micro ways are making the changes. And I see that one of the things that's um, in the Q&A is, is 2030 a realistic target? Of course, 2030 is not a realistic target. But if you don't put a line in the sand to aspire to, nobody's going to do anything and people become complacent. Um, and I just want to, if I may go off track just a little bit, Jamie, something that Helen said really struck a chord, which is the lack of investment in people addressing this. But if you think about it, why do people want to address labor exploitation? Because it isn't commercially viable at face value to do so. People still want cheap manicures. People still want cheap food. People still want cheap food 24 seven. And if you want cheap things, it's at a cost to the human as well as to the environment. And so ultimately the decision is ethics versus the bottom line. That's how it's viewed. I look at it from a different perspective and I say, and I'm the privileged 1% who can say this, I choose to buy well, better with a long-term view, okay? Um, I choose everything you're saying now is secondhand because that's a choice that I make to try and aim for sustainability. That's a choice that I can make and the minority who can afford should do so for the majority who can't afford. That's my first point. The second thing I'd also say is from a commercial perspective and where the UK really went ahead of the curve was with the um, uh, supply chain compliance. OK. The reality is businesses need to turn around and say, if I have exploitation in my supply chain, what does that also tell me? Well, inevitably, you've got money laundering, bribery and corruption. And the board are the ones who face the criminal responsibility in my courts looking at sentences that they will not like in prison for their failures. 
So it's a tough call to make, but as someone who's been described as too aggressive for the boardroom, which I'm quite proud of, um, I'm afraid it's a tough but realistic call. And I hope that deals with something that um, has been raised in the chat. Why, do, why is this not getting the media attention it requires? Because A, it's not sexy. B, nobody wants to pay more for something that's not increased in value. It's that simple. Okay, there's a car shortage in the UK because of lightning conductors or superconductors, forgive me. Why is that? Well, maybe people are being paid properly for making superconductors. We talk about supply chain issues. What are those supply chain issues? It's because people have voted with their feet and said, you know what, I'm not working for £3.30 anymore. I want my fair minimum wage for minimum work hours with the right conditions. So we need to be more compassionate, less users, greater understanders and more cautious purchasers. Lots of us will be listening in. Like I, I could just go on all night and I realise that the clock will not allow me to, but I, I could listen to that. And also I talk too much, Jamie, so no, you, know, you I, can shut I, me I, down. I could honestly, I could listen to the three of you all evening. I hope everyone else is feeling, feeling the same. Um, but um, we can see how you guys are making those ripples that, that make the tsunami. But, but Jenny asks, how can one as a, as a private individual, some of us that, that aren't involved at the level that, that you guys are involved in, uh, but how can we make a, a difference as individuals, as you know, maybe a small charitable foundation? How can we add the ripples that create um, the tsunami? Helen, what is your answer to that? I would double down on what Caroline just said. Uh, so as a, as a personal consumer, you know, you may not be in a position to change all your spending habits right away, but I would just start with one thing. Um, I remember my first thing was apparel. I really looked at those supply chain, um, you know, policies. I picked the brands that I felt like were in line with my values. And that meant I shopped less and I usually paid more when I, when I bought my clothes, but that seemed like a, a good trade-off for me, you know, and then you just add one type of commodity at a time and you, you try to change your lifestyle a little bit. And there's um, a website that is kind of fun, kind of depressing called slaveryfootprint.org, where you can actually go through and kind of talk about or put in how many different types of things you have and it calculates number of slaves that might work for you based on what we know about supply chains and where um, there's forced labor in different industries. So that's as an individual. And then as a small charity, I would say um, I'm a really big proponent of trust-based philanthropy. And it's not something that we can always do at the Global Fund because a lot of our funding comes from governments, which comes with a lot of, um, a lot of requirements. I'll just leave it at that. But if you are in charge of, um, you know, some money that can go to philanthropic causes, um, I would say trust the organizations that you already know are doing good work and just say, you choose how to use this best. Um, Justice and Care is a great organization and a great example of that. I'm not just saying it because they're here. Um, because they were able to actually meet the challenge of COVID. Um, alongside our program. So we had planned for certain things. Um, one of the things we didn't plan for was a pandemic. And so that meant a lot more, you know, emergency groceries, emergency rent, um, and having flexible funding, knowing that's going to where the organization had, has deemed is the greatest need is a, a major gift. And um, we always talk about within the global fund, you know, kind of $1 of unrestricted funding is kind of worth, you know, 100,000 of really restricted funding. Um, that might be too much of an exaggeration, but really not, not much more. So those would be my two things. And Helen, um, Katie's asked for that website address again. I'm sure other people will. Yes, I will drop it into the chat. That'd be so helpful. Um, we, we want to, I'm again, aware of the time. Um, and Jake um, asked earlier around whether the 2030 figure was realistic. And, and Caroline, I think, you said, no, definitely not. And, and there was nodding around the panel, but you have to set something to make it happen. Uh, but he asked, which I think is a really good way of finishing is, is you know, where are we seeing hope? Where are things getting better? Where are things, where are we seeing progress? So can you ask, each answer that, we've got a minute each or so, because I think it'd be a really good way of ending. Have a go, Caroline, you, you, can, you can do it. You might have a minute and a half. Thanks. Um, okay, here are the changes. We have a modern slavery act in the UK, 
where before, if you were convicted of a trafficking or exploitation offence, which only came into law in 2014, the maximum sentence you could get was 14 years. I've locked people up for trafficking cocaine for three times that length. Now the sentence is life, which reflects what you are stealing from someone else. So that's a big yay. Two, the number of prosecutions is slowly creeping up. Three, societal awareness of this criminality is increasing. Four, we have people like Helen and Nicole and you, Jamie, and the organisations and Jenny's charity who are asking and doing. To me, that's slowly climbing the stairs. Every inch counts. Every footstep is a step further towards success. Will we eradicate this? No. But every time we stop and we prevent someone being exploited and or we get them out of exploitation and recover their dignity, that's a big success. That's great. Thanks, Caroline. Nicole, where are you seeing progress? Um, look, I, I think that a lot of what, what we're seeing while we... It, it can be discouraging that we've got a long way to go. I see incremental gains that are really key. Um, I see that the, the introduction of the Modern Slavery Act, for example, while it, there have been limitations in its enforcement in ways, particularly with regard to things like the supply chain legislation, uh, it has attracted attention, has it attracted resources. You see the business community starting to uh, listen and to think about what that looks like. Uh, we're seeing innovation in terms of um, the, the iteration of, of legislation and, 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 and approaches um, that are more uh, effective, I think, over time. Um, and I, I'm seeing collaboration in so many different forms. We've talked about it amongst, uh, amongst charities, amongst prosecutors. I'm seeing it too in the finance sector coming together to, to, to help inform better detection um, in payments, for example. Uh, seeing it um, in, in other spaces where sectors, tech coalition, for example, um, technology companies are starting to, to recognize that they have some responsibility. So they, we're on the move, I would say, and that brings me hope. We're on the move. I love that. We, we need to hold on to that. And, and Helen, where are you getting hope from? Um, bringing it back to my example of apparel, I remember when Nike was boycott a while ago. <laughs> I won't say exactly when I don't want to date myself, um, but it was kind of this, you know, angry automatic response. How can Nike have sweatshops? And I think what we are seeing now from both um, the markets and consumers that people understand that, you know, particularly companies understand that people want to buy clothes that is transparently made um, as transparently as possible and they are meeting that demand and consumers are also responding by paying a fair price for those products and so I think the notion that this is a zero-sum game you know somebody has to lose is incorrect and I have a lot of hope that the narrative is now around well, what is the win-win? What's the mutually beneficial discussion? Um, and we know that, you know, we're now hearing from financial institutions about risk, you know, and they're realizing that if there are supply chain issues, and by that, I really mean forced labor exploitation in supply chain, that is material risk. And that business and that company is no longer um, a good entity to invest in. And that is a real change from even five or 10 years ago. So I see a lot of hope there. And I also see a lot of hope in just general um, awareness. You know, there's always more awareness raising to be done in the public. But I remember when Taken came out, um, I really love Liam Neeson, so it's not a comment on him, but people really thought that human trafficking was all about, you know, the teenage girl being pulled into a van and the understanding now that people's lives are much more intertwined with trafficking, that it's in the products we choose to buy, the food we choose to eat, the consumer decisions we make, it may be overwhelming to some, but it should also feel empowering because that means we have the ability to do something about it. And we have not had that before. And the last thing I will say is in the US, we are actively stopping goods made with forced labor at our borders. And we are saying this is not in line with our values and we will not tolerate it. And that is something that we in the field have dreamed and talked about for many years and are kind of in disbelief that it's actually happening now. Um, so I do think progress is being made, even though we still have a lot of work ahead of us. 
Caroline, Helen, Nicole, thank you so much. Thanks for giving us hope. Thanks for lending us your, your wisdom. Um, it's been fascinating. We really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for, for joining us. Thank you for your support. Um, it makes our work possible and it spurs us on. And, and let's create these ripples together because we are going to get a tsunami, I believe, um, in the fight against slavery. Thank you.